Welcome everyone. My name is Tess O'Brien and I'm thrilled to be chairing our next session, which is called Government Innovation, Agile, Decentralized and Blockchain Powered. And I'm, I'm excited because in my work at Bloomberg Associates on the Media and Digital Strategies team, I spend a lot of time thinking about how can we make our governments thrive in the digital era? And, and what I mean by that is how can we not just leverage technology and you know, use these exciting new tools such as blockchain, but how can we design in a way that is agile and iterative to ensure that we are delivering residents the best and most effective services possible? And that's why this is a very important topic. And truth be told, when I first saw the session topic, I thought, boy, there's a lot of buzzwords right there. But you know what, I was thinking about it, and as I mentioned, it's not just about the technologies that we use and ensuring, and, and the foundations in order to employ these technologies effectively, such as ensuring our processes are interoperable, um, but it's also about how we, how we design these different services and making sure that they're agile and iterative. So we have a phenomenal group of speakers today to talk about how we do just that and to talk about some real life examples. Um, we're going to kick off the session with a keynote from Carlos Moreno, who has come from Paris. He wears many hats. Uh, among them, he is the mayor of Paris's special representative for smart cities, and he is also professor at the Sorbonne University. And he is particularly known for his vision of the human smart city and livable cities. So I'm excited to hear about Carlos, from Carlos. Then we're going to dive into a thematic dialogue with both Gianni Minetti, the CEO and founder of Paradox Engineering, which is part of Minebea Mitsumi Group, I hope I pronounced that correctly, and Bruno Opatio Ruiz Ruiz, the Executive Director of the Intelligent Cities Enabling Infrastructure Initiative at the Development Corporation of Chile, which is part of the Ministry of the Economy. We're going to have a quick coffee break following the thematic dialogue, but I highly advise you to stick around because following this break, we're going to have a fantastic panel focused on collaboration and governance models to drive urban innovation, featuring an all-star lineup. Um, but now, to kick off the session, let me introduce Carlos Moreno. Thank you. Thank you, Tess. Thank you, Tess, for uh, introducing me. Good morning, everybody. My name is Carlos Moreno. I am a scientist. I'm a professor at Sorbonne University, and I am the scientific director of the Entrepreneurship, Territory, and Innovation Chair. And as well, I am the mayor of Paris, especially boy for smart cities. It's a great pleasure for <coughs> uh, present uh, to you our vision, in particular, about the human smart cities. In the vision of the city of Paris, based on the uh, work of uh, researchers, innovative uh, people, uh, stakeholders, and the relationships, in particular with the uh, professor uh, Mohamed Yunus, the Nobel Prize. In fact, uh, we have uh, launched on uh, May 22 the uh, ETI Chair, Entrepreneurship, Territory and Innovation Chair. In fact, we want to develop for territories a concept based on human-centered vision. When a smart city in Barcelona has started nine years ago, the question is in particular the role of technological solutions. And during several years, the technical, the technical center approach was very important in several cities. In Paris, we are convinced that the real question for people is to develop new services, new uses, 
new solutions in order to improve the quality of life of citizens. What is the quality of life of cities? The quality of life of cities is not the technological solutions. The technical solution is a way, this is a leverage if we wanted to improve, but the real challenge for cities today is to build a sustainable city. What is a sustainable city? The sustainable city is the convergence of three several challenges. The environmental challenge in particular in the, this decade and the next decade about climate change and preserve the biodiversity. The second challenge is the social inclusion. How can we develop the inclusive cities? How can we fight racism, populism, demagogic ideas? And the third point is the economic challenge. We consider that the sustainable city is at the same time a livable city, viable city, a fair city. This is the capabilities for a city for invest, investing one euro for innovation with the need to invest for one euro in the environmental solution, in a social solution, in an economic solution, in the convergence. We need to develop this human-centered approach because the cities are the very complex system. This is a picture of the city of Paris, uh, the city of uh, the great Paris. This is a picture five years ago, only five years ago. You have the Seine River, and you have this motorway. This is not a city for human. This is a city for car. What is the role for car in cities? At the center of cities, at the heart of Paris, to close to Notre Dame. What is the role of environment? The water, biodiversity. What is the role of the people? In this uh, peak, people don't exist. Only drivers. And more, one person per car. This is today the real challenges for transforming our lifestyle. The lifestyle for live, for produce, for consumption. And we need to take the radical measure to transform. This is the same place now. This is the urban park. Seine River. This is the same place. The car have disappeared. We have people. We have all kinds of possibilities for people to live, to pleasure, to, to eat. And this is the difference when you use a real human-centered approach at the opposite the technical approach. What is the interest for transforming the car for autonomous car, for example, if we continue to have the traffic jam? We prefer not invest in individual cars for continuing to have a traffic jam. We prefer to invest in for people at the center in the city. In fact, the real question for us today in the city of Paris is another. It's not to solve the very complex problem only with the technological solution. The modern urbanism are focused in order to find the solution by infrastructures, 
we want to go anywhere, we have the possibility to have the car, the collective trans common transportation, and other. In fact, the real question today in cities is, wh why do we move on cities? What is the real reason? We have, developing, we have been developing um, research uh, about uh, this uh, crucial topic. And in fact, our conclusion today is if we have a human-centered approach in cities, we could very well identify the essential needs for human in cities. And we propose, in fact, a model based on six essential social urban functions. If we want to, to have not a smart city, but a happy city. If we want to, to have not a smart citizen, but happy citizens, what are the criteria for people to be happy in cities? In fact, we consider that if each one of you in your city, in your territory, in your district has the possibility to access to the six essential social urban functions, we have the possibility to become a happy citizen. What are the six essential fun urban functions? Living, working, Supplying, caring, learning, enjoying. If each one of us has the possibility to access to the six functions at the same time, with a very great optimization, we have the possibility to be a bitter me, a bitter we, a bitter world. Because, in fact, the problem today in several cities is the, the junction between my home, my work, my different social functions, and the distances that exist today are the very relevant constraints and the solution for satisfy this content is to offer different mobilities, individual car, collective transportation. In fact, we consider that maybe the radical solution for mobility is promote the immobility. Why? Because if we consider that a happy citizen is the person that could access to six essential social urban functions, living, working, supplying, caring, learning, enjoying. If we could deliver these functions in a short perimeter, only 15 minutes by soft mobilities in a compact zone, or 30 minutes in a low or medium density zone. We have the possibility to increase the three states of the happy citizens. The well-being with myself and my family, my friends. The sociability myself with my neighborhood and my colleagues of work, and myself and the planet with a sustainable planet, inclusive planet. We have, in fact, three states of each one of us, bitter me, bitter we, bitter world. If we could offer 
in a shorter distances these services, you have the possibility to change the paradigm. The question is not if we could have a new mode of transportation. The question is radically different, is how can we reinvent the proximity? This is a new paradigm because in this case, we are very interested for solving the real problem for citizens in a daily life. Reinvent the proximity for us is to develop the concept of the city of short distances. I am a pioneer of this way. I have been developing the concept of human smart cities. And for six years, myself and my team of research, we have been working about to, to modernize the concept of the city of short distances based in this idea to develop, to propose the city of 15 minutes or the territory of 30 minutes. But the significant point is not to consider one central point in cities. The problem in cities today is the very strong specialization. The historical center, the business center, the cultural center, the park, the zone for students. The city, in fact, are very specialized. We wanted to propose another paradigm with the concept of polycentric city. The polycentric city is the city with the possibility to reinvent in different points of cities the city of 15 minutes. Each one of areas will become the city of 15 minutes. In this case, the paradigm is not the same paradigm because the mobility is the possibility to be happy in my area and the possibility to go if you want to, to go uh, elsewhere based on this idea. For that, I propose at the international community a new index, the index of high quality societal living. And we propose to evaluate the quality of this high societal urban level. This is a matrix with the possibility to access of each one of urban social functions correlated with the state of satisfaction of each one by a bitter me, a bitter we, a bitter world. We have been deployed this uh, uh, concept today in the specific area in Paris and in the three other cities um, close to Paris. This is the project Paris Norgate. You have a stand uh, uh, for uh, uh, showing this uh, development because we have been developing a methodology, human center, in order to build this kind of grid a network of cities of 15 minutes. We have the um, methodology in order to collect the different data, not for have data, but the target is to explore the territory, to explore the proximity, to explore the district, in order to reveal the resources. Uh, the revelation of resources is the possibility to become with the, uh, how my district is very rich in services, but several services are totally invisible. Uh, after proposing the possibility to develop new hypotheses for transforming my uh, district and other. The key point is to develop the urban ontologies. The urban ontologies is the possibility to know 
my uh, district with the different social urban functions to match the different data in order to build the index of high quality societal life. We have the This is the territory of experimentation in the north of Paris with the multi-governance, because this is the very important point. The multi-governance today is totally necessary if we wanted to, to uh, develop the grid cities. And in this uh, territory, we have been deployed this methodology in order to uh, scanning my territory to find the uh, infrastructures, to find the uh, services, to find the uh, users in the perimeter of 50 minutes. And in fact, we're going to discover our territory. We have the possibility to identify the different level of my territory today in the global vision in the particular vision, and at the same time, we could match with the project for transforming the urban projects in the horizon one year, two, three, five years, a decade. This is a very nice uh, uh, field for experimentation because it's the zone for the Olympic Games in 2024. And the Olympic Games involve today a very strong urban transformation. And the target is to keep people in this area in order to fight to avoid the gentrification, because we need to offer the high quality of service in order to develop this social inclusion. We have the possibility to match with the demographic projection, because the increase or decrease of population changes the uh, solution in the next uh, the 10 years. And we have been developing the different approach for uh, citizens in order to better discover the resources of proximity. This is the torture lamp with the possibility to identify my resources uh, in each one of social functions. For example, we, we could de discover the proximity services. We could customize this uh, kind of services. And we could uh, develop the dashboard with this uh, radar. This is the high quality uh, societal life uh, index with the different uh, item. This is a particular case, for example, the services for, for catering, with the possibility to identify uh, in one day, and in a week, and in one month, in one year, the different services that exist, and uh, the uh, services uh, maybe we need to uh, implant if we wanted to keep the medical uh, coherence. This is the scoring of the HQS ill um, quality uh, societal life demography. We have, of course, uh, behind different data models. Uh, we have linked this application with the blockchain in order to offer decentralized service uh, for uh, citizens. And today, our uh, target is to uh, transform uh, the uh, services and the uses offered in this uh, way. The high quality societal living is not only an index, it's before all a methodology for transforming cities based on a new urbanism. This is not an urbanism by infrastructures, this is an urbanism for users, for services. This is the urbanism by hyper proximity. This is the urbanism for discover the proximity, for discover myself, my family, my neighborhood, my worst colleagues, and my planet. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Carlos. Well, I'd like to reintroduce Johnny and Bruno to the stage to join me for a thematic dialogue. So as I mentioned, Gianni Minetti is the CEO and founder of Paradox Engineering, which is part of the Mini Bear Mitsumi Group. And Bruno Apathio Ruiz is the executive director of the Intelligent Cities Enabling Infrastructure Initiative at the Development Corporation of Chile, which is part of the Economic Ministry. So, Gianni, I'd like to start with you. And I'd love to hear from your perspective, being that of the industry, what is the importance of openness and interoperability? Okay, thank you for the question. I realize we have no slides, okay, so we have to do everything by improvisation, okay. Um, openness and interoperability, the importance this on uh, specifically smart city, which is the main topic of this week, is the same importance that we have seen uh, happening uh, in the evolution of the internet, okay? If we think about, and thank you for Carlos, okay, because it gave me some good anchor points, okay? What is a smart city? Smart city is a, uh, an environment where, uh, which is sustainable, liveable for people, and uh, also, also foster local economy, okay? For enabling social inclusion, okay? Now, if you take this, okay, and we go back to the history of uh, digitalization, okay, in the 70s, the producer and consumers of data were machines, okay, called mainframes, okay? And then, by then, during the 70s, the industry realized that interconnecting those machines with networks, okay, was creating added value and actually was creating information and actionable information. And we had the first networks of proprietary network, proprietary machine exchange data, uh, owned by corporation, large governmental agency. And then we saw the evolution, okay? After the mainframe, okay, we saw the um, workstations, okay? And uh, different scale, high cost, again, the industry uh, realized that interconnecting the workstation was creating ad additional value. And so we saw the first uh, industry proprietary standards for interconnecting those machines. And then we have all the story, okay? Uh, mainframe, workstation, personal computers, mm. okay? But something happened, okay? Uh, between the workstation and personal computer, okay? It was the release of the internet protocol by the ARPA agency. And suddenly, okay, everyone was able, okay, to take that specification, that standards, okay? And create an application, okay, to interconnect to the personal computers, okay? And the economy that we see today, uh, what we are enjoying today, downloading an app, okay, in exchanging information on social media or whatever we do on the internet as we know today, this is all due to interoperability and openness, okay? The people, okay, that made their success in creating the app, in creating the website, in profiling their job, it's all because, okay, they were able, okay, to factor and inject their creativity, okay, and their uh, invention, okay, into an open and interoperable environment, okay, and they were able to promote, okay, and emerge on that. The same should be on the cities, okay, because if we continue, okay, workstations, okay, a mainframe, workstation, personal computer, and then going down in scales, okay, portable, laptop, mobiles, and uh, today we are in the age of uh, Internet of Things. Internet of Things is nothing else than, uh, is nothing something out of the blue, okay? It's a different scale of devices that measure different phenomena, okay? Because again, the industry realizes that capturing this information, okay, specifically from a city, whatever it is, lighting, parking, waste, water, uh, pollution, okay? Collecting this data, okay, uh, trans transporting this data and analyzing this data is creating uh, additional value, okay? As someone said, I believe it was Newton, there is nothing you can improve if first you cannot measure it, okay? Mm -hmm. And you can improve mobility, you can improve pollution, you can improve uh, anything in a city if you first can measure for it, okay? How these are used, okay? And how this, uh, how you can plan ahead, okay, in increasing 
or adapting or making a smart use of these resources. Okay? It's the same for our car. Okay? We, all know, this is we all know very well this. We know how fast we can drive our car because there is a dashboard that is telling us how much fuel we have, how much we are consuming. There is someone telling us where is the next gas station, and we should know okay, how much money we have in the wallet. And then we drive the car. Okay? It's, uh, the same is for the city. Okay? If we want to have a smart city which is livable for people, sustainable for people, and uh, uh, foster economy, okay, so enable, give to people the opportunity okay, to leverage in whatever infrastructure we are going to invest into a city, this infrastructure should be open and interoperable. Okay? So next generation, people that much, have much more creativity okay, than us from the industry we have, okay, uh, much more liberty than the industry has, okay, they can basically inject this creativity into what we have seen happening into the internet. Okay? Could we even image 20 years ago that we would have been wandering around okay, with a small, I think it was my, my smartphone, okay, and with an app and managing our life okay, basically out of a smartphone? No. Okay? Can we imagine what would be okay, the smart application of the future? Can, do we know what is the value of mashing up the data of parking, with lighting, with pollution, with traffic, with weather, with news? No, we don't know. But I'm 100% sure that outside this audience, uh, at least outside me, okay, there is someone that knows how to do it. Okay? So we, we need to provide them the tools okay, and the possibility to do that. This is a, a livable city, and this is social inclusion, and this gives the opportunity to people to grow. This is all about interoperability. Okay? And we, from the industry, okay, the harsh, brutal industry that we have to generate revenue, we still have to generate revenue, okay, <laughs> but okay, not to the detriment okay, of the nice buzzword okay, that we are leveraging, okay, smart city, open, interoperable. Okay. We have seen this in the past. Okay. There were proprietary networks from industry, okay, and those proprietary networks from industry, today they only exist in museum of computer science. Today it's all about the internet open and interoperable. Okay. Right. The same will be tomorrow. Okay. And uh, yeah. Oh no, I was going to say, well, you touch on a very interesting point um, mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. the differences perhaps between the private sector and industry and perhaps mm. the public sector. And Bruno, I'd love to hear mm. your perspective, you know, being a representative from the public sector in Chile. Do you, do you agree with, with, with Gianni? Um, and, and from your perspective, what is the importance of interoperability and openness for cities in particular? Okay. Mm. Uh, thank you, Tess. Uh, uh, for uh, Corfo, Corfo is uh, the development agency of the Ministry of Economy in Chile. Uh, develop and promote smart city is a very big issue. Uh, smart city is insert in industry four, uh, uh, and in 2017, 2000, uh, we we study we study el, the gaps in in, in our country. Um, the main the main gaps are. Uh, our uh, city, uh, the, they are uh, the bigger than city in Europe. In Santiago de Chile, by instance, uh, we have uh, seven million people, uh, wow. seven million inhabitants, uh, with uh, 35 municipalities, 35 different municipalities, right. autonomy, uh, autonomy governance in, in each municipality. And the problem is, is very big. We need interoperability. You, I, I, I say, like say uh, Carlo, I live in An Las Condes, I, uh, uh, my municipality. I work in Santiago. I study in Providencia. And so uh, the, the problem is who, uh, who the, the, the citizen live in a better, uh, in a better city. Uh, and the experience of the citizen uh, may be the same. Uh, it depends on the live, it depends on work, it depends on study. Uh, in Chile, uh, uh, there, there are a lot of systems, but any system are isolated. Proprietary system, not open. Uh, for Corfo, for our agency, the importance of the openness is create an enabling condition, enabling infrastructure to deploy new sensors. A lot of sensors, thousands of sensors, to connect in our in, in the same infrastructure. No 
no, no, no have a, a network for uh, parking, another network for lighting, another network for, for environment sensor, and we need only an infrastructure. In, in Chile, we, we replace our street lighting today. Uh, we change uh, all, all system to LED system. In, in LED system, it's possible to put uh, an enabling infrastructure of wireless sensor sensorization. The interoperability, uh, furthermore, permit allow entrepreneurship innovation mm. and third part to connect in the same network. Uh, openness is the key, but, but we need to uh, maintain the security. Uh. Uh, it's openness must more security. I'm, I'm smiling mm. as I'm listening to your response, Bruno, because it's interesting. I've been doing some work in London and what you're saying just rings so true, where oftentimes in large metropolitan areas, they're made up of many uh, mm. individual mm. municipalities. In the case of London, it's many individual boroughs. Um, and people don't live in a discrete mm. borough, or in your case, in yes, yes. Santiago de Chile. They don't live in one space. They, they move around. And, and the idea that perhaps um, that's not a seamless process seems, uh, you know, it, it just seems like it, it should be easy to do. But of course, it's something we've taken mm. for granted and it relies on this interoperability. I'm, I'm also from Sydney, which is another city made up of many municipalities. Um, but you finish by touching on security, which of course is such a key issue today um, and very much at the forefront of cities. Um, and so I wonder, how can we marry interoperability with security and, uh, and does it undermine cy cyber security in particular in any way? Well, it's, um, if you go out and you ask okay, to vendors, okay, and uh, how openness and interoperability copes with security, okay, you may get two type of answers. Okay. Number one, okay, my system is closed, so no one knows it, okay, so I know what's going on in my system and uh, so it's secure. Okay, and uh, it has to be kept secure because I'm using it on critical infrastructure and so on and so forth. The other opinion is that, well, my system is based on open standard, okay? The community can uh, help me to audit. The community can help me to improve the system. Of course, okay, the community knows, okay, what is in my system, okay? And so I will capitalize from the, uh, the knowledge, okay, and the uh, the willingness of the community to contribute, okay, to uh, the quality of the system and the things, okay. Which one, okay, I believe personally is the second one, okay, and is the openness, okay. This is one of the things, okay. Uh, but today for smart city, okay, and IoT in general, um, new paradigm of cybersecurity should be kept in consideration, okay. Uh, today we approach the cybersecurity and the IoT with the same methods with the same models and I would say with the same technologies okay that we have been using over the past 40 years okay so password protection uh, encryptions okay and so on and so forth okay um, nothing wrong against that just we have to cope with a new uh, breed of devices very small devices okay with very limited uh, resources with limit, very limited capabilities okay that are going to be deployed in hundreds of thousands, probably millions, okay, of units uh, into an area. They all interconnect among themselves, okay, mm. and uh, from the um, the bad guys, okay, from they represent a tremendous army, okay, of potential device that you can start use, okay, and to generate, okay, disruption in services or denial of services, okay. We have seen what happened in Mirai Boot back in 2016, when cheap webcam, okay, broke down. Okay, all on the uh, East Coast, okay, the Financial Times, the Twitter website, okay, and all was generated by cheap camps sold at Office Depot, okay, with a standard password, standard, uh, even saying standard password, standard username, it's, it's wrong, fundamentally wrong concept, okay. But you can generate attack from that, okay. Now, of course, okay, there are plenty of technologies and methods that allows you to bring a higher level of cybersecurity into small embedded IoT devices, okay? But th here is the other constraint, the cost, okay? Mm -hmm. There is a continuous tendency of reducing the cost of those devices, okay? And uh, 
keeping increasing and higher level of cybersecurity in device, okay, that on the other hand, they have to keep costing less and less and less. It's kind of conflicting, okay, point, okay. Uh, we do believe that there is another technology, okay, that is, will uh, uh, be of a great help, okay, actually, we at, uh, at Paradox Engineering, we are uh, leveraging uh, on that, is using cybersecurity. Cyber, uh, sorry, is using blockchain for cybersecurity. Blockchain for cybersecurity uh, provide you a uh, completely different methods okay, of protecting the data. And when I say the data, I'm saying the data that are readings okay, from the, um, the lights or the phenomena, but also the instruction. And the data is also the software okay, that you push on the remote device because it provides intrinsic defense to the information itself. Any information that comes from the embedded device on the field or any information that goes okay, on the embedded device can only be validated okay, by blockchain and blockchain is built on several key pillars okay so it is decentralized completely disintermediated it's built on strong and public uh, asymmetric cryptography okay and, uh, uh, and so there is no central point of attack okay if you want to change anything on any device okay uh, only the consensus of the peers belonging to that blockchain okay can validate that okay and an attack such as Mirai Boot, okay, or um, uh, let's say a scaring scenario, okay, where hundreds of thousands of sensors connected to lamp posts, okay, are starting to shut down and blink, okay, or blink the lights of the city, are very, very, very uh, much less likely, okay, with the blockchain technology. Now, what is blockchain? In uh, three words, okay, blockchain is not something out of the blue, as IoT is not something out of the blue. It's a natural evolution of uh, few comps that exist since decades in the computer science uh, industry. Uh, we started say, speaking about the internet. The internet allows you to duplicate information. I have a PowerPoint, I take my PowerPoint, I send you my PowerPoint, and after that, we have two sets of this PowerPoint, okay? And then you broadcast to all of them, we have 100 sets of PowerPoint. So who belongs? Who is the owner of that PowerPoint? We don't know, okay? Blockchain is totally different. Blockchain is the, allows the transfer of the ownership of the information, either I have or you have, okay? And under this paradigm, okay, the information of commands, software, firmware upgrade or whatever, okay, that goes on the device, okay, is either, okay, the one that generated it or the one that is received it, okay? Not someone else, okay, that want to hijack the system. So the combination of these two things, okay, and understanding that the blockchain uh, address a fundamental uh, point, okay, that the internet, as we know today, did not address because it was designed for different purpose, okay, which is the transfer of ownership of the information, okay, and the secure of the information, not by central agency or central uh, point of command, but just because it's completely decentralized and disintermediate, okay. This is what will bring, okay, highest level of cybersecurity into the IoT age. Okay, because we expect, okay, that one of the biggest barriers for adoption, okay, of IoT and smart city and sensing would be, well, what is the level of risk I'm exposing my city by connecting all these devices? Okay? And so and should, we, should be ready to have a strong answer. To that. And is that something that you're thinking about in Chile, or is that... Are you trying to support cities as they consider the use of blockchain? Uh, in Chile, uh, we, we promote uh, use standards uh, open, uh, like uh, IPv6, IPv6 for, for low power. IPv6 uh, uh, has a lot of uh, security future, like uh, cipher, uh, like uh, password, uh, private key, uh, certificate. And blo blo blockchain is, is er early today in Chile, uh, but uh, in, in, in a lot of the industry, Corfo is promote blockchain. Uh, by instance, in clinical information, uh, I, 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 the patient, I, I am the, the patient, and uh, it's, it's possible to protect my information with blockchain. In, in, in Chile, uh, uh, we don't have uh, open data today. today uh, no, not anymore, no, not today. <laughs> uh, but uh, 
we need a, a, a manner of, of para to, expo, to expose and to disponibilizar disponible, disponible, this, this data. Me dice que en español la señorita. <laughs> bueno, más fácil. No, eh, ya, yeah, gracias. Eh, entonces, eh, en Chile somos, somos muy avanzados en algunas tecnologías. Tenemos un sistema de intermodal de, de transporte muy avanzado, telepeaje muy avanzado, pero son, todos los sistemas son aislados y propietarios. <coughs> y nos hemos quedado muy atrás en Open Data. Y Open Data es una necesidad. O sea, si, es, si queremos transformar nuestras ciudades en ciudades abiertas, en una Open Smart City, con Open Standard, Open Collaboration, Open Governance, Open Culture, eh, necesitamos adoptar esta tecnología. Entonces, una de las maneras de, de, de poder lograr la Open Data es entender y explicarle a los dueños de la data, que en este caso serían las municipalidades en un comienzo, que eso es, pos es posible y es seguro. Porque hay, hay mucho miedo a exponer la data. O sea, por, por ciberataques o, o porque están entregando datos que no convienen. Por ejemplo, si yo digo que la contaminación ambiental en este sector es tanto, se puede generar una alarma pública. Entonces, hay, todos quieren prevenir eso. Entonces, una de las maneras de, de impulsar la Open Data es utilizar tecnologías como blockchain, donde tú sepas a quién le entregas la información, donde yo sepa que la información no ha sido adulterada. Eso es muy, muy importante. Y con eso vamos a poder avanzar. Y lo, que, y lo otro, lo otro que necesitamos y estamos impulsando en Chile es tener centro de gestión. Hoy día nosotros tenemos un centro de gestión de la metrópolis. Cada municipalidad gestiona sus recursos, gestiona la televigilancia, gestiona la, el alumbrado, gestiona los estacionamientos, pero no hay un centro integrado. Eso, eso es muy importante. Y este centro integrado es que debería preocuparse de la interoperabilidad, la seguridad y de las distintas maneras de cómo monetizar, uh -huh. cómo, cómo entregar esta data al público, a la gente para una mejor calidad de vida. Gracias. Well, thank you so much for that explanation. And um, it, uh, what I caught, it sounds like you were saying that it's largely about helping people to understand the opportunities within blockchain and making sure that they um, that in the, they understand that there are so many opportunities given the decentralized nature of governance in Chile. Um, but I might not have caught all of it. But thank you both so much for those insights. That's incredibly helpful. And given that it's so early, I'm sure everyone is in need of a coffee or a cup of tea. And so please, down the back, we have a few refreshments and we will be kicking back off in about 15 minutes time. Thank you. So the name of the session is collaboration and governance models to, to drive urban innovation. We have excellent speakers here, very varied and with very, very different and interesting perspectives. I'm Giorgio Priester. I'm leading an organization called Major Cities of Europe, which uh, is dealing with exchanging uh, um, uh, experiments, uh, exchanging ideas, exchanging uh, pilots, exchanging uh, real experiences in, uh, in uh, uh, innovation in cities. Uh, our team is made of people that are doers, which means that they are not researchers, they are the ones who are going to really do things. And so our panel is really about how do we, do we achieve in reality what we want, uh, we want to do. So I tell you the names of the speakers and then I will call them one at a time on the, on the stage and then after you have presented you can sit down here. So we have the first one is Leonie van der Boyken, it's correct, Amsterdam Smart City Program Director. Fernando Nogueira from the city of Sao Paulo, Open Innovation Lab, uh, head of uh, Mobilab. Uh, Kari Aina Eik, uh, she is from Norway, but she lives in Vienna and she's leading an organization from United States, from United Nations, called uh, OER and uh, uh, United for Smart Sustainable Cities. She's the Secretary General, and then Michael Donaldson, he is the one, he is the one from here. She is from Barcelona and Commissioner for Digital Innovation from the city of Barcelona. So Leonie, you are the first one on the stage. Please come over and the stage is yours. Okay, thank you. Am I working? Yeah, now yes. I am. Okay, welcome uh, all uh, to you here, over here. I'm so happy uh, to be here, very honored to be part of this session in how we can decentralize and have governments and corporations, everyone working alike in a different way. My name is Leonie van der Meuken, and uh, I'm the, the program director of Amsterdam Smart City, and would like to share some thoughts the way we are trying to have these 
vibrant, livable cities, cities where people can live their dreams in. How do I click? Here. No. Works. I'm sorry. Uh, somebody's coming. Yeah. We're in this world of transition and change has been taking place very rapidly, but unfortunately not fast enough. We all know climate change is facing us and we are not addressing these issues fast enough. So we need different ways of cooperation, different ways of working together to speed up. And we think we, we need an independent place where we can work together open and safely and constructively. And we at Amsterdam Smart City try to provide this space. And we collect people who have not a set mind, but with an open mindset, curious about another, who know and understand, like we were talking about uh, blockchain, that power and finance and systems need to be were arranged in a different way, much more distributed there where it belongs. And people who are not about talking anymore, of course we need to talk like today, and we need to listen, uh, but we need to act as well. So this, these are people we collect and work with, and we are many of them. These days, everywhere in the world, people are taking onto the streets, which is really a sign of hope, because these are people who matter enough, care enough to go out, and they think it, it does matter to go out. So this is a sign of hope, people taking action to make this world a better place for all of us. So what do we do as Amsterdam Smart City? Uh, we are this uh, independent organization, 10 years ago already founded by the city of Amsterdam, and a big energy uh, corporation, because they believed we need to cooperate, but in a different way. Let's not do be uh, the foremost partner as being a city, and let's try differently. And at least 10 years ago, they already thought it must not be about technology, it must not be about digitalization, it must be about the problems we want uh, to solve, to, the, the aspirations we want to aspire. So what do we do? We have this international community growing ever faster, and after today I hope we grow again, because there are more than 7,000 people, change makers connect, they can meet online, you can even post your event and meet offline, share your ideas, share your knowledge, because we're pretty sure, well, if I share a cake, it gets less, sometimes that's better. If I share knowledge, it multiplies, it gets more. So that's why we try to have this interconnection. And then we have this program, very proud of, 20 partners at this moment, from the government, the so-called quadruple healings, from the government, from societal organizations, private organizations, and knowledge institutions, and they all work together, uh, creating uh, these uh, living cities, and they combine with the community as well. So, like I said, we're not, my partners, nor we from Smart City, we're not about creating this smart city. I believe almost no one does anymore here. We are about creating a livable region. Like Chile said as well, it's not about Amsterdam. The moment Amsterdam raises their uh, parking fees, it has a huge effect on their surrounding cities. Then people who already cannot afford to live in Amsterdam also cannot afford to visit Amsterdam, visit their parents, have their kids go to school. So we need to think differently, not on city spectres, but on regional spectres. And we need now to be smart, of course, we need to be smart, but we need to be wise and we need to speed up. So what we do is take people along, have different forms of energy from fossil to green, have a, a safe understanding of uh, using our resources and mobility, which, uh, like uh, Carlos already said, people can express their needs. It's not about the means of how we transport, it's how the way we'll be able to connect and go to play, go to work, go to... Uh, whatever you want to do, and of course we address our digital uh, revolution. And we try, the way we do, we try to have a digital revolution which is humane still, which is beneficial for people. So how do we do so if we connect people from so many different organizations, and we want to have a digitalization really about humans, uh, for us, we don't have a fixed program, we don't have fixed KPIs, nor fixed milestones, but what I do have is fixed values. These are of utmost importance. So when you join us, you endorse these values. When you do a project, you endorse these values, because it's always about Citizen Central. How do we behave? What are our needs? Uh, lots of things are changed, but humanity, the needs of being human, to be seeing each other, touching each other, 
playing with each other, that is a constant. So whatever we do, whatever we change, keep in mind who we are. So the citizens and persons are central. Whether you're a public or a private company, when you work with us, you create public value. Uh, with revenues, of course, with public value. And you to try to do, everyone tries to be as open and transparent. It's important to share your mistakes, even as a professional, to open up so people can help you. It's also important to be open so uh, other people can join and build upon. And of course, we do it by learning by doing. We're facing wicked problems. We cannot study too long. We must act, learn, try, apply, improve. And I'm going to speed up as well. For us, our partners do the work. They are the ones uh, in the projects. We, as Amsterdam Smart City, provide the workspace. A space which is open, it's safe. People are happy over there. They're constructive. So it means that it's for the other people a safe place to bring your dilemmas, bring your questions, and be able to contribute. You're there not for, as a stakeholder, but someone who has put something on the table and contribute. And have fun. We strongly believe fun is very important to endorse the creativity we need to speed up and work together to have a clear understanding. So how does it look like? We have so many projects, and for me it was a hard choice. Uh, which one I'm going to show you? I have four. This one is about measuring air quality, not by the government, not by only the citizens, but by citizens and governments and societal organizations together. Because together we need to find an understanding how the city is working, not one against another and fighting, but have, they, they put their interests at the same time. They, they have these devices built and so they, they can have an interaction. This is another one, very nice. I saw a lot about mobility, but this is about big cargo coming in and personnel joined with the university. And how can we uh, have this big volume of goods entering the city organized in a different way? I do not want personnel. I do not want to pollute the cities with huge cars and huge emissions. So these fossil fuel trucks come in uh, uh, at, at the edge of the city and they reload their paper, their drinks, their whatever in much smaller vessels, so even at the smallest streets of uh, the city of Amsterdam, they can enter without blocking everyone and polluting the air for everyone. This looks like a no-brainer. It's really hard to have people and the people from commute procurement to make this change. So that's why the university and we are in helping to speed this up, because it's a no-brainer, which it's, it's slow. And then we have this digital parameter, and I'm, I'm um, we're stopping at that. Here, uh, we have uh, the soccer game at 2020, and we're going to use uh, digital tools to have a safe place, a safe from criminality, safe from overcrowdedness, and safe uh, from losing your privacy and autonomy, so it's transparent. It's, so I want to end with this. What we want is people joining in, collaborating, bring onto the table the knowledge and the expertise you have, and if you feel inspired, and I hope you do so, Please join the community and let's act upon cities to dream in. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leonie. Um, before calling the next speaker, I want to say, please prepare your questions. We will have 15 minutes afterwards to have questions. You have the microphones here, there. And uh, it would be good if you, if you have a, a good question to ask to the, to the panelists, because I think it's quite interesting. So next speaker is from Sao Paulo. Fernando, please. Hello. Uh, hello, is this working? Is this on? Yes. Um, you want to click on? Okay. So, uh, thank you. Uh, where does it go? It, just here? Yeah. Okay. Okay. You have the, you have the clock here. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, Good morning, my name is Fernando Nogueira. I'm from the Sao Paulo City Hall. I'm the head of Mobile Lab Plus, an innovation, open innovation lab uh, linked to the Innovation Secretariat. And we're going to talk today about our vision for um, a more humane and smarter Sao Paulo and a few of the projects we are doing. So uh, this is a new area in the Sao Paulo uh, City Hall. It was created in 2017 with the goal of putting technology in a strategic position and helping foster a digital transformation of the city. So when we think of a smart city, generally we get this kind of picture, this kind of imagine, uh, imaginary. 
uh, when we get, uh, we daily get uh, contacts and calls from vendors trying to sell us the next app that will transform Sao Paulo into Songdu or another uh, such kind of smart city. We do have some areas in Sao Paulo that are somewhat similar. Uh, this is uh, a view from the Pinheiros River. But we also have a very different Sao Paulo. This is an actual photo from uh, uh, the outskirts of the city. And many, many, many million people live in such conditions. And we can't pretend that a smart city will transform overnight uh, this kind of reality into that kind of reality. We have to deal with real life, with real problems, with historical legacy issues that we deal, and this is the setting. So that led to a big discussion, and we came with this vision that a smart and humane Sao Paulo transforms the municipality's management and citizen delivery service using technology and innovation to reduce inequality and especially making life in the city easier. So in reducing inequality, helping citizens is our main view. Technology is a means to an end, not the end itself. And we have, some, we have defined some principles on how to do that. Uh, so less focus on apps and technology by itself, more focus on improving service provision. No solutions looking for problems. Focus on the problem and then uh, go after the better solution, which might or might not involve uh, advanced technology. Avoid bureaucracy digitalization per se. We don't want to reproduce. We must improve the service and then digitalize, not just uh, have a new kind of e-bureaucracy. Less futurism, more realism. Protecting data and privacy are citizen rights, not a luxury, not an afterthought. Technological solutions must be interoperable always and open source as much as possible. And technology is a strategic partner, not a protagonist. So these is our, um, some of our challenges, our main challenges. I'm not going to dwell on all of them, but uh, I'm going to show you two examples that deal with many of those challenges. So uh, the Secretariat for Innovation and Technology is dealing with those four major fronts, improving citizen service, upgrading digital technologies and digital inclusion, fighting the digital divide, which is still very relevant in Sao Paulo, uh, promoting changes in internal public management, and fostering uh, innov the innovation ecosystem. Sao Paulo as the largest city in Brazil, one of the largest in the world, has a very rich and complex ecosystem, universities, startups, big companies, and we think that we can solve we know that we can't solve everything by ourselves, but we can do a lot better if we uh, uh, promote open innovation. So uh, I'm going to focus on two projects coming from our innovation labs. First, the 011 lab. Um, it's the code area for Sao Paulo. That's the origin of the name. And so uh, this deals mainly with uh, change promoting change in how government works and how people, public servant works. So one of the examples we did, uh, we have a, a major website where people can log on to, to request service to, to call like uk.gov, uh, for example. Uh, it's called SP156, it's the number. And people had a difficult time using, just one small example, if you want if you want to get a bus pass, a really important thing for our, our citizens, um, you, could, you, you would have a difficult time finding this. You'd have to roll uh, really down on the web page, and then you'd have two options, transportation and transit and traffic. And then why did we have this situation? Well, because not because we are thinking of the citizen, because there exist two different municipal companies, one dealing with transit and the other dealing uh, with transportation. So we changed that. We did. Uh, um, we got uh, KPIs and and many measurements from how people were using the website, but we also went to the streets talked to the citizens, saw which kind of difficulty that, uh, they got using the website, how the citizens understood the different, over 
hundreds and hundreds of public services we provide. We got them uh, doing workshops. We got them involved in card sorting. OK, how do you better understand what's the best, word, best wording? So we combine all that using agile project uh, strategies and methodologies. And then we got a much better uh, web page and less bounce and many, many good results. Uh, we heard this kind of, uh, uh, we heard public servants saying, I was afraid of going to the citizens. I'm not afraid anymore. I'm not afraid to actually talk to the citizen and ask for his opinion. So it's a huge mindset change. The second uh, one uh, is from the, the innovation lab I run. Uh, it's called Mobilab Plus. It began just focused on mobility, and now it's towards uh, open innovation for a smarter Sao Paulo. We work with startups. Uh, we were important in opening uh, many sets of data. And uh, the last one we did, a hackathon about two weeks ago, to open up radar data. We have over 900 radar in Sao Paulo and really a throve of big data, really many, many potentials to come up with new applications, new solutions to our very complex traffic. Uh, so these are some of the kinds of projects we're doing in Sao Paulo, and uh, we hope this way to achieve a better, more human city. We thought that it was really important to, sh to think what we understood as a smart city we know that Sao Paulo won't become a really smart city overnight, but we can promote many, many changes and really impact and make a difference for the ordinary citizen. Thank you. So next, we are going to listen about what the United Nations are doing to develop some concrete actions towards implementing sustainable cities. Thank you very much. You hear me? It's working? Good. Put this um, over here. It's good? Yeah, yeah. OK. No, it's good. Good. Yeah. Uh, thank you for inviting me to join this panel. I'm very happy to be here and tell you a little bit about the program. I have only eight minutes, so it's a little bit difficult. But I'm going to give you a brief overview of this program. First of all, I don't want to start to talk about smart city before we put this up. Because if it's not sustainable, it's not a smart city. And I think finally now, the smart city context starts to make sense because you get sustainability into the mix here. And we are working, uh, and I said, with the SDGs coming in 2015, uh, with the Sustainable Development Goal number 11, a focus on cities and communities, we actually also got a very good mandate uh, to work on sustainability in cities and see how we can tr you do this transformation in a city space, but in a bigger context of development, which I think is the most essential part here. The program that I'm re representing and leading is called United for Smart Sustainable Cities. It's actually a program that we started in 2014 with one UN agencies. It's grown now to 16 UN agencies. It's the biggest program in the UN context now on localizing the SDG agenda to the cities. And as you see, it's very cross-cutting in terms of which agencies are involved here. But also, it's not just the agency, it's the cities, it's the private sector, it's the finance sectors that is part of that that makes this really a unique, innovative project in a UN context. The project is set up like this. As you see, the ecosystem is a complex ecosystem. It's the program in the middle here, the UN agencies uh, that is representing all the different experts and areas of the United Nations. It's the cities, but also the governments, clearly, because the member states are members of the UN, so we have a push uh, up from the bottom-up approach, but also we have the national states at our table. We have the ministers and the mayors in the same room. And of course, for policy development on cities, this is exactly what we need. Then private sector should be driving this, clearly. That's why we need the solutions. The whole program here has been set up to actually get uh, upscale solutions into the city in a massive way together with the private sector and the financing. If we don't have all of these elements in together, we are missing an element. There is a holistic approach. The glue, actually, I think it was one of the former ministers in Netherlands that told me, Carrie, nobody's investing in the glue. Someone needs to put this and facilitate it in a big scale. Not one and one cities, but how can we learn from each other? So that's the whole idea of the hub. We have four or five main areas of the program. I will not be able to go into all of them. But the basic thing is, we need to know where we stand. 
We need KPIs, we need data. We need evidence-based data to know what's the state of our city, what's the biggest challenges, which type of technologies do we need. We have all, as we heard here, everybody's knocking on the door to the cities with new technologies and apps and everything, but how does it fit into what we have and what we need in terms of also the budget we have, the biggest challenges in the cities, the environmental impacts, all of these things is complex and we need data for that. I'm going, just going to show you the method of the data collection that we are using. Second is the technology, clearly the digitalization, cross-cutting all the areas of infrastructure in cities, but it's, it's uh, technologies in every field of infrastructure that needs to be integrated into a better way into the cities. It's the financing. How do we, in, how do we finance all of these projects? You know, I'm not to, I'm probably not here to support Amsterdam. They're doing a fantastic job. But a lot of, lot of cities, the main issue is financing. How are we going to finance the SDGs? How are we going to finance the smart city solutions that we really want? We need more innovative ways to finance the cities. Then it's all about citizen engagement. And, and Leonie's right. This is, we need to engage from the bottom up. People, we're doing it for the people. So that's why the cities are the perfect case, because that's where the, cit the citizens are living. But we need them to understand why we do the decisions that we do. So the citizen engagement part is crucial to get our cities on the border. And the last but not least is a global hub for learning and best practice. Sounds like a cliche. How many hubs do we have out there in the world? But do they really work? Do they really work in terms of solutions? They work on policies. Yes, we have a lot of good platforms for policy discussions, but they go home and they are faced with the issues. We leak, the, the pipes are leaking. In a Norwegian city that we're evaluating, 40% of the water in a Norwegian city is gone from the source to the tap. This is crucial things. We need to put this at the table. So the uh, evaluation, that's the only thing I have time for here because I see I have three minutes. It's the first UN standard to measure smartness and sustainability in a city. It's a unique, it's the first policy tool that the UN is doing at this level. It is measuring, as you see, very broad. It's 92 indicators, 54 core, the same for every city on the planet because we need to be measuring. Are we all going in the same direction? How can we be sure that we are reaching the 2030 agenda? Now we have no clue where we stand. This is 54 core indicators, 38 advanced indicators. That's the, that's the technology. This is the digitalization. And that's why we've been able to bring the private sector in, because each of those 38 indicators is actually a business case. So we get the businesses interested in getting the data from the cities now that we can open up the business cases for the cities. As you can see, econo economy, environment, society, and culture is a very broad uh, for some cities, maybe I uh, would say it's just too simple. But when we evaluated some of the Norwegian cities now, we see they are dark red on some of these areas. And these areas need to be put up front because this is essential to reach the 2030 agenda. This is a scoring of a KPI. This is a Swiss city, very green. The mayor said, I said it will be very green. He said, I hope it will be very red because then I will get the case to get more support into my city. Each of the KPIs is linked to an SDG. Actually, we're creating a roadmap now to actually be able to report on the SDGs. Are we reaching the target? You can see, of course, SDG 11 is mainly represented into this evaluation, but we are working in depth in a lot of these other SDGs in the different cities that we're already in. We are using different tools, like visualization in a total new way of displaying this data of the KPIs so the decision makers and everybody understands what this means for my city and how do I go about it. Each of the KPIs is a business case. We have lots of transportation, for example, KPIs. We can see immediately in 10 cities in Norway, no car sharing. Okay, here we go. Yeah? We need to find better ways that we can scale this up. We have evaluated around 100 cities. We have 200 cities on the waiting list. When we start to get now masses of cities using this, you, for the businesses, it will be a very interesting case to cooperate with us to get access to a lot of these cities and programs. These are all the areas that we work in. Of course, everything from waste to security, cross-cutting digitalization. And this, this, the, this is the clue. It's the holistic approach to help the cities from A to Z, starting with collecting the data, using the data, verifying the data. We're doing independent verifying of this data. Going into a city design, we have 4,000 city planners and designers in the platform currently working with the citizens hand in hand. And I mean, the UN system, of course, I think it is set up for this. Of course, you think about the UN, you think about peace, security, food security, all of these things. But of course, this, the UN is out there in every region, in every city. And if we can activate now the expertise within the UN system, what we're trying now with the 16 UN agency and linking up to a lot of other partners, I think we have something we can move quite fast in this.
that's what I wanted to say. Any question? Thank you very much. So next, uh, but not least, Michael, where are you? Oh, you're here. Please. Bon dia, benvinguts a, a Barcelona. Estem molt contents de, de tenir-vos i d'haver pogut compartir aquests dies amb vosaltres. Welcome to Barcelona. Good morning, everybody. We're really happy to, to have you all here in the ninth edition of the Smart City Congress. And we hope uh, we see each other uh, next year. We've got a very special uh, year coming, 10th anniversary of the, of the Smart City Congress. I had a presentation uh, and uh, I wanted to talk about the digital plan of Barcelona on the different issues that Giorgio presented. But um, we had this discussion on, on Tuesday in, in, uh, in the world CIOs and CTOs uh, meeting breakfast. We have it every year with all the commissioners and CTOs from around the world. And there was a, a main concern, there was a, a concern that we that we all shared, and and I and I wanted to 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 share it with you. It's related to to data, uh, and it's related to 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 digital rights. So it's about trust. It's about accountability. Let me explain you that how the conversation went on. We started talking about how to make a data driven organizations. So we started in a very techy level. You know how we gather the information, how we get all the indicators, all the sensors on the city, how we, we, we put them all in a, in a data lake, uh, all the different web services, the, the, silos, the difficulties we have uh, with all our information, with the silos information, and, and the usual stuff that we, we all share. You know? Uh, how we get the data and how that, that data works afterwards in order to, to get a data driving organization. So after, after this discussion, we, we shift uh, towards uh, open data. How do we engage citizens to interact with our data and all the problems that we all share uh, connecting to, to people? How do we, how do we make people interact with this data, create new visualizations, interpretations of this data, so how we get a real collective intelligence with, uh, between the public institution and the, and, and the citizens, because this is what a smart city is, is about. It's not about sensors, it's not about only data, it's about bringing collective intelligence on the, on the city management, on the city policies. So everything went pretty well. At this, at this stage, it's all about technique, uh, it's all about technology, it's all about digital transformation. But there was a moment uh, that we, we, we started thinking about uh, that we might not be doing things properly or, 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 or we might have to do things in a better way. Talking about uh, the big concern arising from citizens uh, with data, with the privacy and what's done with our data. Or, or what public institutions do with, with our data. We all, we all had in common, or we all thought that the, there's been uh, uh, a change after Cambridge Analytica and, and Facebook and other different scandals. Uh, people were not such aware about the their, their data two or three years ago, but now it seems to be, or is, it is a, a problem, and it's a big problem. Because the thing is, big companies, Google, Microsoft, and, and, and many, other go, uh, many other companies, they gather information, they, got, they gather data about us you know, on a daily basis. You know, the way Netflix sends you an email on, on Friday night, according to what you've been watching, you will, you'll want to watch this movie or this TV show for, for the weekend. And we don't seem to care. But when it comes to the public institution, the one who is gathering information, it's like the big brother uh, coming here. It's the big brother doing the monetization of, of our lives uh, with the facial recognition and, and other different techniques. Okay, so we've got a problem here because we are supposed, it's not that we are supposed, is that we use this information we gather in order to deliver better public services. 
It's not that we want to monetize anybody. There was a big scandal last week here in, in Spain. Our National Institute of Estetics uh, was gathering 10 million movement, 10 million people movement through the mobile in order to make better policies on mobility. And in all the newspapers, they, they not only said that this was kind of illegal, but they also told us how to disconnect the phone, how to download apps to, to avoid the, the surveillance system. Very funny, because if you download that app, you'll probably be giving more information to the, to the company that has provided us the, the app. No? So as I said, we've got a problem here. And we need to bring back trust between citizens and public institutions. So it was very funny the way all techies, all technologic profiles were talking about politics. We were talking about how to gain the confidence, the trust between citizens and, and the public institution. It's not about getting data, but gaining that data. And, we're not, and we are only going to gain that data if we're able to build this trust between public service, between public institution, because we have to deliver common goods, we have to deliver for the, for the public interest. And it's all about participation, it's all about collaboration, it's about transparency, and which is more important, it's about accountability. And that means to not only to do things, but to explain why we do these things, how much it costs us, and especially why we do these things and we don't do other things. There are many interests, uh, society is diverse. Diversity brings us rich. It makes us as a city much better. But we need, we need to, 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 to deliver, uh, I insist, certain, certain policies. And we need to explain why we're choosing those policies and not choosing other, other policies. So this is a, a, big, a big challenge. We are, we are facing. It's important to say that transparency and accountability is also sharing weakness that we as public institution have. Uh, Leona appointed that in, in her speech. But if we are building a, a, a trust environment, we should be able to share our weakness. We, we don't have to know everything about everything. So we need to, to bring, to, to have this uh, ecosystem of trustness, of collaboration, and try to make better cities, because it's the future of us, uh, of us all uh, who we are facing. Thanks a lot. So first, <coughs> Questions from you. Microphone is there. If you want to stand up and go, uh, we, will be, we will be very pleased to answer. They will be very pleased to answer. Uh, question? Yes. No. Then we are ready to have a discussion between us, and you will have questions maybe later on. OK, so let me start uh, with you, Leonie. Uh, now, I'm very curious about what you have explained to us, because I feel that one of the big challenges of cities that are developing, developing those uh, uh, new uh, services by involving citizens, by involving companies, by involving, and by being open to collaborate among cities is something which ideally is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Now, it seems like that your model is looking to implement it. So can you say a few words more about why you've chosen this model of, uh, of developing um, not Amsterdam, but the whole region, and then opening to the rest of, of, of the world and say a few words about it? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. Uh, we chose this model uh, already like 10 years ago, and it has been expanded because, and, and you address it the same, a government cannot do it by himself. A citizen cannot do it by himself. He just is not school enough, for example. A trained professional in, uh, in mobility is not a trained professional in energy. So people are very different, with very different capabilities. Government can make rules and regulation. Private company can bring it into the floor. A citizen can express their needs and also to bring in the expertise. And these societal organizations are the ones thinking in a different way, and we also are trying now, it, it's the next step, I hope, to bring in artists and philosophers, philosophers onto the table. So for us, a strong belief that the differences of people we need to use, uh, and then sometimes we have a private company who asks the government, 
please speed up and make some more strict regulations because that's the only way my business model is going to be compliant. But it's very hard. I am now working for a year, but we're working for many years, and still sometimes people get real connection and then they speed up very fast. But still, so many times I have these quarrels uh, between two partners, deep misunderstanding. So that's and what's what I liked about you. We need time, we build trust, we build joy, because that's what now I'm learning, that if we, 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 we put time on joy and trust, then we get these open minds and people are starting questions, not rhetoric to have questions, but really open questions. And the other part which I really think is very important, uh, at least in the Amsterdam region, is um, looking beyond the boundaries of your city. Our city is way more smaller than the yours, and we have uh, lots of equality between the cities, which makes it more difficult, because the surrounding cities are always a bit angry with Amsterdam being so big. So that's another thing what I try to do, is have these unequal partners work together in an equal way. And, uh, well, we're on this and, and, and hoping to improve. And, and, but now the, the first results are coming in and this inspires us to go along. Yeah. Okay, I have many more questions, but yeah. let's go to the others yeah, and then do. we'll come back, okay? So, Fernando, yes, very interesting what you're saying. And, okay, over every city around the world have very big inequalities, as you mentioned. In some, but your example is, to me, very interesting because you have shown some extremes of inequalities. So, um, uh, I think it's very interesting to understand a little bit what, something more about, uh, about uh, not the, the, some, those people uh, living in the favelas, uh, how they are, they are, how are you able to engage them, what is their response. Uh, I have some experience, by, by the way, doing something like that in Africa, and usually the response is excellent, yeah. if they, but maybe you can tell something more about it. Yeah. Uh, we have many challenges addressing this. Um, most of the city hall is really in the center of Sao Paulo and downtown Sao Paulo. And we have people living in the outskirts that take up to two, three hours using public transportation to get to the center. So it's really a big challenge. When we first began approaching and inviting citizens, we realized that most of the cities we were engaging were middle class or upper class because they were closed or they, they had more access to internet, to, to uh, maybe more time to do this, so we had to innovate also on, on how we uh, do this uh, using other kinds of uh, strategies for research. And we also realized the importance. Uh, uh, governments generally are really bad at communicating. They use legalese, they use uh, uh, bureaucrat words and, and really legal terms. So one of the main things we also are doing is a plain language um, policy. So. Uh, we are trying to, we, we come up with a law in Sao Paulo and also uh, with um, um, workshops on how to train public servants to speak, in a, speak and write in a language that citizens will understand. And we are trying, it's a plan for the next year, to procure innovation so that we can use internet, uh, AI to really analyze all of the government communications and uh, try to understand uh, how, uh, w what we can do to improve. Uh, so and before, before the going to carry, just yeah. one question: Do the, the people living in favelas having uh, using uh, mobile phones and being connected? They do. They do, right? Yes, they uh, do. Uh, mostly thanks. Most of them use Wi-Fi. They don't have computers, but they have smartphones. You provide Wi-Fi, and, yeah. and we have public Wi-Fi, and we have been expanding. Excellent. Now, Carrie, I have. Uh, I put myself in the shoes of, of somebody managing a city, so the mayor or the city managers, and by listening to you, I am very interested, I am very motivated, and uh, I feel I'm going to incur in a big risk that uh, to promise something which maybe I will not be able to fulfill. And so the question is, I have two questions. Uh, somebody tells me, oh, this topic of sustainable cities is a buzzword. Uh, it's something for politicians. They say, my city is sustainable, and that's it. You're saying something very different. Show me that, okay? And then if I have to show you that and I discover that I am not sustainable, then I, am a, I have a problem. So tell me a little bit how, how you feel that this can be managed. Is this working? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 
Uh, I think, I mean, of course, I'm not probably uh, uh, objective here, but I think uh, sustainability is the main, it will be a new world language. Someone asked me actually last week, Harry, this sustainability thing, we're almost tired of this word sustainability, but I think if you see the grassroots engagement for sustainability, and I think any change in the world needs to come from the bottom up because it's something people feel for. If you see now what we are, well, very young people are motivating around the world on environment, for example, it's something growing here now. And it has to do with sustainability, it has to do with the future, how we protect our society. I just want to come back to what Michael was saying on the stage here, because it's all about trust and transparency. Clearly it is, but we need to know what, we need the information to know where we stand. And it, it, by this, you know, I would see some simple collection that we've done uh, in this data, making it transparent. I recognize that in not all countries, cities will make it transparent. Actually, some countries have asked us to change the color from red to orange because it's too in your face, the <laughs> results of the evaluation. But I was talking to a mayor, for example, in one of our Western European countries, and she said the biggest value of this evaluation is actually the democratization of process because you have to open up we open up this data now for people to see where we stand and we recognize we cannot do it alone i i cannot do it as a mayor alone i need everybody to help to make this happen so in that sense it is it's not meant that mayor should solve all the issues or the smart city the coordinators but it, and that's why also there will be a lot of unpopular decisions that needs to be made to be able to move the cities into this more sustainable ways of do managing cities but then at least people need to understand why we need to do these decisions that we need to do why do we need to use our tax money on these type of issues and not these type of issues so for me it's all about natural data and i think that's if the un brand for anything is good it's for the neutrality every country owns this organization and it's not a biased way of looking at anything but trying to be neutral and i think that's why we are picking up momentum because we are just going in, we're just evaluating, this is the status, and we have no politics in this. This is just basic infrastructure related to smart and sustainable cities. Thank you. I will, we will come back to the topic. To you, uh, you are always, yes. Yeah, I have. Uh, so what, now I put myself in the shoes of a citizen. <laughs> and uh, and uh, the question is really, what, what you're explaining is quite frightening, I must say. And uh, um, I'm encouraged by the fact that Barcelona is taking care of it. At the same time, as a citizen, I'm wondering, because you mentioned an example of a public authority that is using some data, and, and there is an issue because people say, oh, why are you using my data? I not authorize you. Now, the, what a, as a citizen, uh, my experience, and I think everybody here has the same experience, I, I feel that uh, it's not only if government takes care of my data, well, maybe I can trust. Hopefully, yes. But if, uh, what about the private companies? They, 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 have, they know much more than government about me. And uh, how, how, as a public administration, dealing with citizens, so guaranteeing that citizens in the city are, can feel safe about it, you can guide people, you can, I don't know. I'm asking the question. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't really know myself. Um, I don't know. The other day I was in a, in a debate uh, from two members of the civil society. And one of them, uh, Simona Levy, she's an activist on, on digital rights. She was pointing out that it's not about, uh, the problem is not giving data but not knowing what the data is going to be used for. So she made a, um, she came up with a figure with a conversation. I think it was like uh, easy to understand. Uh, the algorithms that they are behind the, the AI and that they're starting delivering uh, public services, which is the, uh, as uh, city Hall is the, is, the, is the main driver in order to guarantee rights. Um, she was saying that the, the algorithm is like kind of a recipe that you need uh, to follow some steps and you need to put in some ingredients in order to have a cake, to produce a cake or to produce wherever. But it's important uh, the, the quantity of ingredients, the proportion of the sugar you put, the flavor, wherever, and it's also very important to follow the, the steps. And 
That means uh, that if recipes or, or if algorithm is like a, a recipe, we need to explain citizens what data we're bringing into to the machine learning and what steps is the machine learning going to give us when we, when we start delivering public services. So as I said before, it's all about transparency and about accountability. This, this generates us uh, another, another issue, another, another problem, is that uh, as a public body, we don't have the profiles of data scientists inside our organizations. And it takes us time to bring, out, bring in new profiles. It's a proceed, it's a guarantee process in order to bring civil servants. But at the time you bring that data sense, maybe the technology has changed. So we are more uh, in the hands of the private sector with not having the, the, the knowledge inside the, the organization. And that's a, a, an important issue we need to, to tackle, we need to, to work on it. Thank you. So I'm seeing that we are almost running out of time. So if you allow me, I would like to ask another question. Uh, you convinced me, I'm the mayor, you convinced me, okay? You convinced me and uh, I want to do it. Now you mentioned in your presentation the role of public sector, right? Of private sector, excuse me. Uh, so assume that you want to tell me, okay, this is, I suggest to you to go forward in this way. Which are, how do you deploy it in, in reality? Because I suppose you need expert people in the private sector to support the city in, de in developing the model, isn't it? Or am I wrong? No, I mean, the method is we uh, collect the data as absolutely quick as possible because this is really just the starting point of the whole program. Mm -hmm. And when we have this in, normally, depending, I mean, we've been testing this in cities around the world, around 100 cities has done it, African, Asian, Latin America, Western Europe, small even islands, regions have tested it. It's very different. Someone used six weeks to collect all the data, some one year. But now we are getting more drilled into the data collection, so that's going faster. And then we are now working with the private sector on the concrete challenges in the cities already. And now already many, many cities have the same challenges. So we're actually speeding up also here with the private sector on delivering on the solution side. So with the private sector, we sit down now and look at the data we have from the cities already and supporting and uh, facilitating this process between the solution providers and the cities in discussing it long before it's even a tender. And anyway, the whole procurement issue is also something we're working with with the UK government on optimizing digitalization of the procurement processes and moving this much quicker and much much more trustful and opening it up because also here we need transparency. The UK government has done a fantastic project on procurement having I think that we're talking about 26 main vendors that was always on the table, now it's 2,600 vendors that is used, small, medium enterprises. You get a much more transparent and open for getting their solutions really out there and into the cities. So uh, I hope you. any company that's here would like to join the program too. Thanks. Fantastic. Leonie, very quick last question. How can you, can you somehow, not guarantee, but somehow explain to us how you manage to deploy your program also worldwide or wider than just the, the region of Amsterdam? Very quickly because we, yeah, are, we, are, we are finished. But, uh, there are no guarantees, but uh, the way we are working here today, uh, meeting each other and having this interaction is one of our ways. So you can go online and have uh, the interaction of ideas on the community, but we also uh, go all over the world to have this exchange. For, for one quick example I would like to give, and maybe it could be helpful for you, we have one of our partners, I'm so proud of them, they went out to the city skirts as well, not these problems like you have, but still the lower income classes. With gamification, they helped citizens to even address what they wanted and what their fears were. And then they put in actors uh, to, to have this equal conversation between professionals and citizens. I was there myself. With the use of actors, I lost my uh, rationality and became the same person as a citizen. So what we try to do is uh, share uh, solutions, but also share means. Uh, in, in order to help each other and learning from you because I've learned a lot. So this is what we try to do, no guarantees, but everything we do adds up. This conference even does. So a big applause for the panelists. Thank you.